Good day to you all. Um, I say good day because for some of us it's afternoon, for others it may be morning, and for others yet it might be the evening or even nighttime. Um, uh, my keynote today is entitled Educating Youth for Climate Justice, Examining and Responding to Interlocking Systems of Oppression. And I think that's quite fitting as we think about uh, climate change, uh, the global crisis, uh, and reparations, and what that means particularly for young people, not just in the United States, but across the globe in terms of what they need to learn so that they can actually continue to be the dream keepers, not only of our earth, but of the livelihoods, particularly of black and brown communities. And so with that, I want to start uh, by giving some acknowledgement around the land where I am here in my office at Michigan State University. I think land acknowledgements can be tricky. We say them, we kind of recite them. Uh, sometimes those who are with us have no real sense of the geographical space where we are, no knowledge of where the peoples might be located. And so I hope that as I read this land acknowledgement uh, for where I am here in Michigan, that these visuals give you some sense of where here in East Lansing I actually am speaking from. So I collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. I recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for, Indi for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledge, I affirm indigenous sovereignty and remain committed to work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Thank you for allowing me to do that. I want to start by talking about why climate change matters in education. Why should young people even be learning about climate change? And Pope Francis made some quotes um, that I think are important to help frame some of my remarks. He said, human induced climate change is a scientific reality and its decisive mitigation is a moral and religious imperative for humanity. He also posited we are not faced with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental." End quote. And I would say climate change in that respect is a social and environmental justice issue. In 2016, the journal Science published the first peer-reviewed national survey of science teachers, which investigated how the debate around anthropogenic climate change affects curricula. It discovered that most middle and high school teachers incorporate only an hour or two of instruction about climate change over the course of an academic year. That's really sad. 30% of teachers devoted less than an hour. Now this is here in the United States. So think about that as we think about even how much access students are getting in the school day to the topic of climate change. Even more alarming, most teachers do not accurately understand climate science to even teach it properly. 
the Yale program on climate change reported 70% of middle school and 55% of high school science teachers do not recognize the scientific consensus on climate change. And according to the National Center for Science Education, 40% of teachers who integrate climate change into their science curriculum actually teach it inaccurately. So we have some work to do even in teacher preparation if we're going to actually deliver content to young people about climate change that is accurate and substantive. Let me mention some other reasons why climate change matters in education and why young people should be learning about it. Black and brown communities are disproportionately harmed by the effects of pollution and global warming. Climate change does not affect everyone equally. The effects take the form of displacement, barriers to food and clean water, loss of land, unemployment, and medical emergencies. And studies have shown that under-resourced communities are much more vulnerable to health problems due to climate change. Things like asthma, heat stroke, heart disease. Uh, uh, folks in Black communities often do not have access to adequate health care uh, due to climate change crises. Uh, Climate change also is intertwined with institutional racism. And I think you're going to be able to make those connections clearly as I continue with my remarks this afternoon. Climate change and colonialism have a historical relationship and they are intertwined. And you heard Mora even speak to the historical as well as contemporary issues related to race, climate crises, and reparations. Another thing that students really should recognize is that environmental movement and civil rights movements were closely linked as we think about the historical and not just civil rights movements here in the US, but globally. Black communities have been active at the forefront of the environmental movement, particularly in the US for generations. Students should learn that a pivotal moment of the modern environmental movement in the U.S. came in September of 1982, when 55 people lay down in the middle of a highway in Warren County, North Carolina, to protest the opening of a toxic waste dump in a predominantly Black community. These are the kinds of things that Black students nor any student really learns in their K-12 education today. Another reason climate change matters in education is because popular conversations or discourse about climate change, quite honestly, are whitewashed. And we need to change the narrative and lift up counter narratives. And lastly, young people don't know that activists of color have always been a part of environmental movements. And in that way, numbers four and five are connected because those dominant whitewash narratives really represent erasure of the work that Black folks have done historically and in contemporary times to address climate change. And so I want to start off with presenting some essential questions to you. That's what I'm calling them. Whether you're an educator or a policymaker um, or an administrator in higher ed or K-12, I think there are some essential questions, four to be exact, to consider as we think about ed educating young people about climate change, Africa, and reparations. The first is why is an exploration and understanding of climate change important? to young people's development and livelihood. And I want you to note that I said exploration and understanding. It's one thing to raise um, black students and other students consciousness and awareness, and then to move them to action, to redress and address problems. How do we help them become agents of change? <clears throat> 
Secondly, what are the interconnections between the climate crisis, racial inequality and inequity, and reparations in Africa and the world at large? And it's important for our youth to understand those connections, to be able to connect the dots and understand that this issue is structural, it's systemic, and it's not only about what nature is doing, but about what systems and people in power are doing. Thirdly, what lessons can youth draw from world history to consider practical approaches to achieving climate justice and repair? And how can educators cultivate students' cross-cultural awareness and understanding of climate justice, racial inequity, colonialism, and racial capitalism through K-12 curricula. Now I call these questions essential because a question like number four pushes boundaries, particularly in a US school curriculum. Terms like colonialism and racial capitalism often make general citizens nervous. What are you teaching my kid? What are they learning? But I would challenge all of us at this conference today to push beyond those boundaries because young people need language to name what they see, what they experience, and what they know to be true happening globally. So let's start with uh, looking at some of these particular points that I raised here. I just want you to know, I'm gonna hit some of these five more in depth. And the first that I wanna start with is thinking about climate change's disproportionate effect on people and communities of color. Because the focus or one central focus in this conference is on Africa, I thought we'd start there. Right. As we think about why our youth need to understand that people of color and black people globally are disproportionately negatively affected by climate change, I wanted to lift up uh, some of the challenges that the motherland faces. Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents in the world to climate change, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 2022, every part of the continent was affected by extreme weather events, ranging from wildfires in Algeria to catastrophic flooding in South Africa. Africa's climate has warmed more than the global average since the pre-industrial time, noting the sea level rise along African coastlines is also faster than the global mean. You'll see here under increased warming, I put some additional information. Uh, just a couple years ago, uh, Africa was either the third or fourth warmest years, 2021, for the continent on record. Increased temperature contributed to a 34% reduction in agricultural productivity growth since 1961, more than any other region in the world. And many parts of Northern Africa have experienced extreme heat, which as you heard me said, has been accompanied by wildfires. The State of the Climate in Africa 2021, a report, reveals that rainfall patterns are disrupted, glaciers are disappearing, and key lakes are shrinking. And rising water demand combined with limited and unpredictable supplies threatens to aggravate conflict and displacement. While Africa accounts for only about 2 to 3 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, it suffers disproportionately from it. And with a special focus on water, the state of climate reveals that high water stress is estimated to affect about 250 million people on the continent and displace up to 700 million individuals by 2030. That's not far away. 
four out of five African countries are unlikely to have sustainably managed water resources over the next seven years. And so I won't read all of this text here, but as you can see, droughts also have worsened, particularly in East Africa. I talked about the exposure to sea level rise risk, as well as um, the lack of coverage by multi-hazard early warning systems. So there is work to be done and our young people need to understand the current context, both where they live, right, in our world, and also particularly for Black youth, what is happening in Africa. So let's talk about climate change's relationship to colonialism and racial capitalism. Because again, these are big terms, but I think it's important for young people to to connect these dots in their curriculum. Some of you may be saying, I don't really know what capitalism is or how to define it if someone asked me. I like this uh, definition here as I think about racial capitalism and nature. Moore says capitalism is not simply a world economy, but also a world ecology that transforms human activity into commodified labor power and into private property and nature into an external object to be harnessed for the accumulation of, of capital. That is key. How helping young people understand how people in power, actors in power take nature and turn it into an external object to be harnessed for the accumulation of capital. Racial capitalism describes the symbiotic relationship between racism and this understanding of capitalism. And in that way, it helps us understand how Black people across the diaspora are disproportionately negatively affected by capitalism operating and manifesting uh, in climate change. Capitalism creates a divide between humanity and nature and deploys science and technology in an endless quest for cheap energy, cheap food, cheap raw materials, and cheap power labor. Young people need to understand that it also creates racialized distinctions between superior and inferior humans, superior and inferior. These distinctions were developed to justify the genocide of indigenous peoples, the enslavement of Africans, and the colonial and post-colonial domination of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Political theorist Cedric Robinson argued that capitalism emerged from European feudal societies, thoroughly infused with racial hierarchies, and then it evolved into a world system that transformed regional and cultural differences into racial forms of domination. And so as I talk more, you'll see I'm hoping um, the connections between racial capitalism and nature and hence climate change and the crisis. Uh, domination of nature and the dispossession and exploitation of racialized human beings are deeply interconnected, right? So racial capitalism and climate change are deeply interconnected. Most analyses of climate change focus on the catastrophic consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. However, some of you may be familiar with this term and others may not. It's important to understand carbon capitalism because we can first to examine and to integrate into curriculum for our young people. So I want to spend a few minutes just talking about what the literature terms carbon capitalism as you understand that as a, a feature of racial capitalism and climate change. <clears throat> 
So carbon capitalism has produced racial, racialized exclusion at every stage of its life cycle. First, the Industrial Revolution, which launched the age of fossil fuels, was made possible by the colonization of the Americas, the genocide of approximately 50 million indigenous peoples, and the abduction and enslavement of, of Africans. Plantation agriculture and cotton in particular were key to the emergence of the industrial power of England first and quickly much of the rest of Europe. The slave plantation colonies of the Americas supplied food, energy, industrial inputs, and markets for British manufactured goods. Second, the slow violence inflicted by the fossil fuel industry on racialized and poor communities all over the world remains a defining feature of contemporary capitalism, right? So young people need to understand how from petroleum development by Chevron or Texaco in Ecuador to Cancer Alley in Louisiana, the extraction, processing, transportation, refining and combustion of fossil fuels has placed disproportionate environmental burdens on racialized communities in both affluent and poor countries. And I want to say that again, because even in affluent countries, it is Black communities who then are most negatively affected. Thirdly, fossil fuel reserves are concentrated in particular countries and regions such as the Middle East that have been repeatedly invaded, occupied, and exploited. Fourthly, the world's most climate vulnerable people are overwhelmingly people of color. They inhabit, we inhabit, geographic locations such as small island states, low-lying coastal zones, and agriculture-dependent nations. Disproportionately, we're exposed to drought, desertification, hurricanes, floods, and as I said, rising sea levels. In addition, these countries have been rendered socially and economically vulnerable to climate change by the North's economic, political, and military interventions. I think it's certainly important for our young people to understand the relationship between countries of the global North and countries of the global South as we consider climate change, reparations, and particularly Africa. Fifth, climate change itself exacerbates poverty and inequality. I mean, just point blank, it does. A Stanford University study published in 2019 concluded that climate change has enhanced economic output in affluent countries, enhanced it. Countries like Norway and Sweden, while depressing economic output in poorer countries like Nigeria and India, right? So we have to think through that. And then finally, Racialized migrants fleeing climate change, poverty, and conflict continue to face death, detention, and deportation when they attempt to cross the militarized borders of the global north. And we know that that includes African migrants and refugees as well. So I hope that gives you some sense of the connections between racial capitalism and uh, climate change and why our young people need to be understanding these concepts and connecting these dots. And so teaching about climate change from a culturally responsive perspective and advocating for immediate policy change requires us to recognize how colonization and white supremacy have always gone hand in hand with the destruction of our planet's natural resources. So what are some frameworks that educators can use as they think about infusing aspects of Africa, climate change, and reparations into the curriculum? I want to offer up a few to help guide you. And one is the five 
trustees of positive youth development. As educators, if we are really trying to frame and develop and construct curriculum that uh, helps us develop social justice youth leaders, we want to make sure that it attends to these five C's, building their confidence, their competence, and for me, that's cross-cultural competence, their connection, their connection to their homeland and Africa, if Africa is not their homeland, developing empathy and care, right? Because uh, how can one fight for climate justice if they don't have a deep uh, sense of empathy and care? And then thinking about building one's char character and moral compass uh, to fight in justice-oriented ways uh, for climate justice. Another is thinking about how social justice-focused curriculum should aid in doing these things. And I think educators have to be attuned to this when you are thinking about how to discuss climate change and reparations in the classroom. How does the material develop Black students' critical consciousness? Help them analyze power relationships. How does it promote systemic social change? Give them ideas about how to do that, even in their own communities. And that goes along with how does that curriculum move young people to take collective action? If we use a critical race framework, uh, uh, which Tara Yasso gives us, which I think is a third one that is really important, especially if you're understanding the climate crisis as, as wrapped up in colonialism and racial capitalism, then your curriculum would do five things. Acknowledge the central and intersecting roles of various forms of oppression and how they maintain inequality, right? Secondly, your curriculum around climate change would challenge dominant social and cultural assumptions regarding culture and intelligence, language and capability, and objectivity and meritocracy. Thirdly, that curriculum would uh, offer direct, uh, be geared towards goals of social justice. The explicit curriculum and the hidden one would also have goals of critical consciousness. And for those of us in education, know there's always a formal curriculum and a hidden curriculum operating simultaneously in education. Fourthly, we have to develop counter discourses. What are the stories, narratives, chronicles, biographies of uh, d Black diasporic people that allow us to understand how climate change is impacting their families and communities? And how do we help young people build upon those stories and narratives to then take collective action? And lastly, how do we utilize interdisciplinary methods of historical and contemporary analysis in the curriculum to articulate the links between education and societal inequality? So I've, I've offered you up three frameworks to help as you move to better refining and designing uh, curriculum to discuss climate change, Africa, and reparations for K-12 students, because as I said earlier, we know that not enough time is spent in any one academic year having these discussions. So let's talk very quickly about the whitewashing of climate change discourses and the significance of youth activists of color. Uh, most discussions about climate change erase not only the long history and influence uh, of uh, humans on the environment, but also the efforts of indigenous peoples and black peoples to preserve it. Even today, many environmentalists uh, wish for resources to be returned to the land without ever acknowledging the historical impact of colonization on the environment. An example is Greta Thunberg, the Swedish activist who started the school strike for climate. 
Now, this got global attention, and there's no slight to Greta and the phenomenal work she um, has been doing since the age of 15, where she started spending her Fridays outside of the Swedish parliament. Um, and at the same time that Greta Thunberg has been get or has been for years getting a lot of limelight, there, there are other activists of color, youth activists, both in the U.S. and globally. I'll go through these momentarily that have been working on climate change issues. Here you see Aaron Wise um, at the center of the protest march to the U.S. White House to demonstrate against the Dakota Access Pipeline being built on indigenous land. Again, U.S.-based activists know firsthand the impact racism, poverty, and colonialism have had on the planet and in their communities. I want to take a minute to uh, continue with those counter narratives, right? Uh, lifting up activist youth of color uh, to talk about African youth fighting climate destruction on the continent. In a recent uh, survey, the Africa Youth Survey, here you can see that um, you know young adult Africans, men and women, uh, responded to the statement about they're actively working to reduce their carbon footprint. And we can see here the number that strongly agree that they are in the trenches across countries on the continent trying to do this work. But our grade school students don't get to see this kind of data in the classroom. They don't get to understand narratives that people that look like them, especially black students, people that look like them are out there, young people on the front lines. A few examples of young activists of color fighting climate destruction on the continent, uh, Masimi Isimi of Nigeria, 14 years old. Uh, she's a Nigerian waste activist and founder of the Eco Kids Green Club that teaches children on general environmental protection and also instills healthy living habits in children. Yero Sar of Senegal is a student and co-founder of the Fridays for Future movement in Senegal. He first got involved in the youth activist climate space at the age of 16, right? He believes that collective action is far better than individual action. Let's look at Raisa Noor Muhammad of South Africa, 18. In their final year of high school, they led a school boycott to demand that the country's environmental department declare a climate emergency. Uh, they were also invited to be an observer to the COP26 in Glasgow um, and this Johannesburg-based intersectional activist strives to decolonize the continent, connecting to activists around the continent to make activism more inclusive and accessible. And then lastly, Vanessa Nakati of uh, Uganda started her journey as a climate activist in 2018. Vanessa founded the Youth for Future Africa and the Likewise Africa-based Rise Up movement. It, that's a platform to elevate the voices of African climate activists, as well as a project to install solar panels in rural Ugandan schools. So as you see, these are counter narratives that our young people don't get in the school curriculum because it's whitewashed, there's curricular erasure, and there's racialization of the curriculum. Hence, their low potential low-level consciousness about climate change. I don't have time to talk through all of uh, these activists and lift them up. But I do want you to see um, here in the U.S., 
uh, youth activism around the Flint water crisis. There were native youth water protectors at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation and also Kanaka Maoli youth defending their sacred land at Mauna Kea. Um, in, in movements, resistance movements here in recent years. And then lastly, across the globe, globe, excuse me, three other youth activists of color fighting climate change, Autumn Peltier of the Anishinaabe Nation, um, Artemisa um, uh, Zacriaba of the Zacriaba tribe of Brazil, and Cachito Cruz of Mexico. Um, 18, both young um, and also eight, fighting climate change in their country, right? But again, these are counter narratives for black and brown youth that they don't get to read about nor um, examine, nor glean strategies for activism in their own communities. And so where can young people go? Climate reparations is a way forward and our young people need to examine and understand climate change, its connections to racial capitalism and colonialism in order to think through reparations. Here I give you a definition of what that could look like, right? Um, based on existing literature from the world. Climate reparations refers to compensation from the world's largest emitters to developing countries bearing the worst and most disproportionate impacts of climate change. Many countries in Africa qualify for that. Why we need climate uh, reparations, I think you get it because they directly benefit those affected by systems of oppression. And this is what we want Black students to understand and all students in schools across the globe, that systems of oppression like colonialism and racism and racial capitalism have led to the, uh, the uh, uh, disproportionate negative um, effect of climate change on communities of color. The vast majority of those most impacted, you've heard me say this earlier, are in West, Central, and East Africa, South Asia, Central and South America, and small island developing states. And the bad, one of the sad parts about this is countries often need to take out loans to rebuild after climate disasters, forcing them to prioritize debt payments over protecting their citizens. That feeds the cycle of racial capitalism. And so as I close, I return to the essential questions, right? I want you to be thinking about these four questions and the way forward, either in your classroom, your school, your community organization. But how might you focus here to think about what's needed to help Black youth and all youth better examine and understand climate change, reparations, connections to Africa, and having a global agenda uh, to, to, uh, to pursue climate justice? And how might the three frameworks that I presented to you help you do that? I'll leave you with a quote by uh, Kenyan climate activist, Elizabeth Wafuti. Young people have not caused the situation we are in, but young people are the solution. That is why participation of youth is key in high level forms like the COP27. And I would add that is why youth voice, youth activism is key in all areas of policy and decision making in all of our um, um, political and educational sectors across the globe. If we are gonna do right, by African countries, Black people across the diaspora, and Black and Brown communities across the globe. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest 
rest of the conference. Dr. Carter Andrews, how did you do that? You, you managed to cover several centuries of history and in the most incisive way to draw the connections between uh, the global climate crisis, uh, its disproportionate impacts uh, within wealthy countries as well as between uh, wealthy and poorer countries, uh, to talk about what young people are doing worldwide, because you know, in the the the, media, the mainstream media discourse would have you believe that uh, young people of color are are completely oblivious and not yeah. doing. I mean, that that was truly extraordinary. Thank um, you so much, Maura. Uh, maybe you. we need to get you to, to develop a course. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm quite serious. That I'd be happy to do that. We'll come back to that. Thank um, you. I, I just, I wanted, we have a, just a, a treat coming up, but I, I wanted to ask you uh, just one more, one question. Uh, I mean, so for instance, it occurred to me, I wasn't an adult, I, I was an adult rather, mm -hmm. before I learned about Dr. Robert Bullard, who mm -hmm. was dumping in Dixie, race, class, and environmental quality in 1990. This is a class, mm -hmm. yep. over 30 years, how many young people Yep. learn about this in school. It, his book is a classic. This is a black sociologist yep. who's talking about the this set of issues or Wangari Mathai for that matter. Mm -hmm. the Nobel mm -hmm. Kenyan environmentalist and the first uh, East African woman to to be awarded the Nobel Prize yep. uh, for her work in two, just 2004. Yep. Uh, kids aren't, aren't getting this in, in class. Yeah. So is there anybody that is doing this well, in your view? I mean, you don't have to name names, but sure, you, know, sure. you know, whether it's it's in informal class settings or after school programs, what, sure. who, who, can, who do we should be looking to? You know, on? that's a great question, Maura. And I think you're on the right track in saying that it is uh, more likely that we will find this kind of education happening in out of school spaces um, because the kind of restrictions and curricular standards um, that we have to adhere to for our young people are not present there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say about that, and, and you're right, um, off the top of my head, I'm unable to name groups, um, uh, in this in this current moment, but there are ways in which um, I think we as a people uh, uh, have to not depend on the schools to do this work, right? And so, how do we look to those neighborhood organizations, those community organizations, where we're doing other kind of cultural identity development to now say, you know what? Climate change has to be a focus uh, and, and the way climate change affects our people and their rights. And how do we now need to make that a focus in our mm -hmm. informal learning spaces? We can't rely on the educational systems to do that for us. So we're, um, you you know, Stan, you, you, you've been forewarned. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're going to be coming back to you. Thank you. Um, I know I, there, we have a whole slew of questions. We've got another session coming up. Um, we're going to have a, a post-conference survey. We're also going to be going back to those Harlem Village, Village Academy students who I hope are watching because um, you've answered <laughs> any of their questions and concerns. Um, and, you know, I, I even see in the chat one of our um, uh, panelists coming up, uh, one of whom is in Accra, Ghana, as well. There are many ways to teach this material. It's a wonderful yes. children's book author. So I hope that you'll stick around as well. Um, yes, yes, thank you. For the next session. Thank you. I mean, thank you is not enough. It really, oh, thank you. Uh, that was extraordinary. We knew that you were going, we knew we needed to have you here today, oh, but you. the, you've exceeded all expectations. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Dr. McLean.